Do what? Yes, you are welcome to take photos and even video, as we are currently doing. Come on in, don't be shy. Come on, pretend you have no sense of personal space. You will never hear me over there. Come closer. Come on, don't be shy. We're all friends. By the way, do not go past the floor on the wall. If you go past the floor on the wall, I get fired. So you do not go past the ah. <laughs> Wait, wait. Yeah, see, all right, all right. Okay, now, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give the tour I would usually give. During the tour or at the end of the tour, you will ask me a question of the form, why did you? Each of you has to come up with a question of the form, why did you? And you're not allowed when it's your turn to say, oh, he already asked my question. So if he asks your question, you have to come up with a new one. Everybody has to ask a question of the form. Why did you? Are you ready? Okay, so we're going to start with a pop quiz. What is a supercomputer? What makes a computer super? The network. What? The network. The network. I'm going to argue that's how a supercomputer. But what makes it super? What qualities must it have? It has to be very, very fast and, well, that's a side effect, but yes, it has to be very, very big. In fact, in order to be a supercomputer, all you have to be is one of the biggest, fastest computers in the world right this minute. Why do I say right this minute? Because it changes all the time. Because it changes all the time. In what direction? What does up mean? Faster and bigger, exactly correct. So if something is a supercomputer today, will it be a supercomputer 30 years from now? No, what will it be 30 years from now? It will be a cell phone, quite literally. If it's a supercomputer today, will it be a supercomputer 15 years from now? What will it be? It'll be a laptop, exactly correct. How about five years from now? How about two years from now? How about two months from now? How about two minutes from now? How many of you have had this experience? You buy the device, and the minute you open the box, it's already obsolete. How many of you have had that experience? Okay, so there's a joke about supercomputers. Supercomputers are like fit. The longer they sit on the shelf, the more they stink. So this is the biggest, fastest supercomputer in the history of Oklahoma. And the great thing is, every three and a half years, I get to say that again. This is Schooner. Everybody follow me. Down and show that crowd. Good, I'll give them a moment to suffer. Okay, follow me again. So how many of you have a desktop or a laptop PC? 
good. So these PCs are just exactly like your PC. For example, how many of you, the processor in your PC is Intel? Okay, so this has Intel processors. How many of you have one gigabyte or more of RAM? One gigabyte or more of RAM. Two gigabytes or more of RAM. Four gigabytes or more of RAM. Eight gigabytes. Wow, that was hard. Eight gigabytes or more of RAM. Sixteen gigabytes or more. Wow. Thirty-two gigabytes or more. Okay, what do you got? Seventy-two. Okay. So I have twelve. So I hate you and all the others that have sixteen and above. So each one of these has thirty-two gigabytes of RAM. That's slightly a lie. There's some that have sixty-four, but most of them have thirty-two gigabytes of RAM. So like several of you. Okay. Hard drive. How many of you have two hundred? Bytes or more of hard drive, 500 gig or more of hard drive, a terabyte or more of hard drive, two terabytes or more of hard drive, four terabytes or more. What do you have? Only two. What do you have? Two, two. Anybody have three? Okay, I have less than a terabyte, so I hate you guys. Apparently, I hate you double. You too. All right? But each one of these has a one terabyte hard drive. How did we choose the size? Size. Huh? Yes, right. Because the day we bought it, that was the cheapest hard drive they had. Yay. Okay. So, so far, and by the way, these hard drives are just like the hard drive you have in your laptop. In fact, how many of you have an SSD in your laptop or desktop PC? These hard drives are slower. These are the spinning disk drives. Why? Because they're cheap. Exactly correct. Good. Why do we want cheap? Because the cheaper each one is, the more of them we can afford. Exactly correct. So everything I've told you so far is just like your PC. I got one more. It's just like your PC. So the red cable, or here we call it crimson. The red cable, that's our Ethernet network. This is gigabit Ethernet. What does gigabit Ethernet mean? How fast is gigabit Ethernet? One gigabit per second. One gigabit per second. What, what does giga mean? Uh, okay, let's do this. What does kilo mean? What does mega mean? So what does giga mean? A billion bits per second. Per second. Thank you. How many of you vote that's fast? How many of you vote that's slow? How many of you vote it depends? Okay, so from now on, anytime I ask you for a value judgment, what's the correct answer? It depends. Good. So, so far, everything I've told you is exactly like your desktop or laptop PC, right? For each of these PCs, there's only three things that make them different from your PC. And of those three things, two of them are boring and unimportant. Are you ready? Boring, unimportant thing number one. They're this by this by this. That's just to fit them in the rack. That's boring and unimportant. By the way, they open up like this and call them pizza boxes. Not kidding. Okay? Boring, unimportant thing number two. Instead of one processor chip, each one of these PCs has two processor chips. But that's boring and unimportant. You can go to any of the manufacturers of PCs and order a two processor PC. It's boring and unimportant. Okay, it's actually super important, but it's boring. But the third difference is crucial and fascinating. Are you ready? On the black cable with the silver connector at the center of each PC, slightly off center. That is a super fast network. And it's 
very expensive. It cost about eight times as much as the human internet. How many of you vote I'm an idiot? A genius. Reserving judgment. <laughs> <laughs> what if I told you that the super fast, super expensive network is 40 times faster than the computer internet? It's 40 gigabits per second for eight times as much money. How many of you vote I'm an idiot? Genius. Reserving judgment. Oh. What if I told you that that 40 gigabits per second? We don't use it. How many of you vote I'm an idiot? How many of you vote I'm a genius? Reserving judgment. Ah, ah. Wait, are you reserving judgment? You got to vote. Everybody's got to vote. Reserving judgment. Okay, good. All right. So, what if I told you that there are two measures of network speed? One of them is bits per second. That's called bandwidth. Anybody know what the other one is? Latency. latency. What is latency? The time that it takes the packet to arrive. The time it takes for the first bit of the message to show up. So it turns out latency is way worse than bandwidth. And the difference in latency between a gigabit ethernet and the super fast network is a factor of 10. Ethernet is about 10 microseconds latency, InfiniBand about one microsecond. Now, how many of you vote I'm a genius? Idiot, reserving judgment. No, I'm a genius. Because, and we've tested this, applications run 10 times faster if they use the fast network, which is called InfiniBand, 10 times faster. How did we test this? Benchmark. No, the InfiniBand crashed. Not on this supercomputer, on the previous one. It crashed, and the weather forecasting folks had to keep running their forecast. So they ran them over Ethernet, and the forecast runs took 10 times as long. If a forecast takes 10 times as long, is it still a forecast? No. No, there's actually a term. It's a hindcast. How useful is a hindcast in saving lives and property? Not useful at all. Now, how many of you think I'm a genius? There are no other modes available. <laughs> okay, so we're good. Okay, so now. I want to show you, I want to talk about storage for a minute. I bet every one of these PCs has a one terabyte hard drive. There are about 600 of these PCs. So how much disk do we have? 600 terabytes. 600 terabytes. And we have about 600 users. So how much disk per user? How many of you go, that is enough? Not enough. Okay, now wait. What if I told you that we have 600 one terabyte drives and we don't use them at all? How many of you thought I'm an idiot? Genius. Reserving judgment. Oh. What if I told you that wasn't the only disk available? Follow me. Get a shot of this, but I think I'll explain it on the Uh, IP Enterprise, all, uh, all kinds of 
things that apply to you. Okay, so I showed you on screen and you took a look at that stuff in the red. And then there's these servers to look inside. So we provide about 400 terabytes of centrally accessible disk storage that all of those servers, all of those PCs connect to in order to be able to have enough disk to get their work done. Okay. Um, so there are 600 users, about 400 terabytes of accessible disk. Why don't we use the 600 terabytes, the 600 one terabyte drives in those PCs? Why don't we use that? Slow. Huh? One of the slow, slow. Um, in aggregate, they're fast, although individually they're slow. VR? Do what? VR? Uh, no, no. In fact, we don't use them for that either. So you're in the right direction. So, so let me go a little farther down that road, but that's the general direction, yes. So here's the problem. Let's say that I'm a PC, and you're a PC, and you're a PC, PC, PC. You're all PC, right? Do I have a one terabyte hard drive? Do you? Do you? You, 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 you. Does everybody have a one terabyte hard drive? If we wanted to put users' data on those one terabyte hard drives in those PCs, would me as a PC have to connect to you as a PC so I can see your data? Would I have to connect to you? You, 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 you. There are 600 of us. How many connections would I need to make? 600. 600. The 599 of you plus my own, right? How many would you have to do? How many would you have to do? You, 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 you. What's 600 of us each making 600 connections? What's 600 squared? Shout that answer loud. 360,000 connections that we have to manage. Is that realistic? No. So instead of trying to do that, we have central disk that each of the 600 pieces connect to. We have a modest number of those. So it's 600 times, let's say 20, instead of 600 squared. So 12,000 12, connected is much more realistic than 360,000 connected. And that's why we don't put the user's data on the internal disk drive. It's not realistic. Okay, come with me. Can someone close that? I'll turn the lock on. <laughs> what did you notice in that aisle over there? It's cold. It's cold. Does anybody know what we call that aisle? Cold aisle. It's the cold aisle. What do you notice in this aisle over here? It's hot. What do we call this aisle? Hot aisle. A hot aisle. How much air conditioning does a supercomputer need? A lot. Okay, so let me quantify it for you. It needs about the equivalent air conditioning of an entire thousand houses, a small town worth of air conditioning. How much power does it consume? Small okay. town. A small town worth of power. To give you the specifics, the supercomputer consumes about 200 kilowatts, about 0.2 megawatts of power. The whole city of Norman which is about 100,000 people, consumes 20 megawatts. So this supercomputer is 1% of the entire city of Norman, power and cooling. Is that amazing? Yes. Good, let's go in here. Touch nothing. Ooh, wow. Don't touch anything. Tell them not to touch anything. Good, don't touch anything, no leaning. Don't touch anything. No touching. 
Touch nothing. Don't touch it. Come on in. Don't be shy. Touch nothing. No leaning. Okay. So this is one of the mechanical rooms. There's an identical twin to this room on the other side of the data center. Sorry. Um, so over here and over here are the electrical panels. They're two completely separate power systems in here. One of which powers rows one through eight, and the other one powers rows nine through twelve. Ironically, the research computing rows are rows one through four. But one of them powers research computing and math enterprise, the other powers math enterprise. Um, so these power systems are quite enormous. By the way, we're nowhere near capacity on this. I think we're running at less than a third of the electrical capacity, the power capacity of this data center. And more it's could be added so if needed. Yeah, isn't that great? Yeah, I always use it. You're maxed out? Maxed out. Maxed out. I can't add any more. So something has to go every time we want. Right. To get anything in, you have to pull something out. Um, well, that's sort of true here. That it's running cooler and leaner. Right. It's sort of true in here, but in here, it's not the power that's going to be a factor, it's the cooling. Because you noticed that that overhang cooling was available in rows one and two, but not in the rest of the rows. It turns out that it's a giant stair step of money to be able to add more cooling into the data center. It costs mid to high six figures and require probably weeks of downtime. And by downtime, I mean very significant because people would be in there with welding torches, welding copper tubing or whatever. Um, and you really don't want to be running a welding torch and a cable at the same time. Okay. So it is unlikely that unless we have a gigantic project that we'd be able to put in more cooling. We have a little bit of ability to put in more power, but right now we're nowhere near maxed out. Okay, so this pumping unit right here is part of the cooling system. You can see these giant pipes that are way to the water, the chilled water plant goes over that away. Um, Chilled water comes in, it goes into this pumping unit, and there's an inert fluid that the chilled water then chills. The inert fluid, you can see, goes up through here. It's labeled refrigerant on that blue label there. Goes up through here and goes into those units up top that we're going to pull air down. And what that does is the chilled, the chilled refrigerant, the, the um, fluid, inert fluid, um, chills the air that comes out of those units. The cold air comes out. What direction does cold air go? It falls. It falls down, and the fans inside the PCs draw the cold air across the hot components and shoot it out the back, so you get hot air into the hot aisle. What direction does hot air go? It goes up, and it gets drawn into air return um, areas on, on the edges of those cooling units that are sitting up top there. And so the air is doing this, the refrigerant is doing this, and the chilled water is doing that all the time. It never stops. What happens when it stops? Disaster. So the heat right. temperature rises at one degree Fahrenheit every 45 seconds until one of two things happens. Either we shut down or we melt down. Which one do we choose? Shut down. So we will auto shut down and well before it gets to that threshold, we get a panic that we need to scramble the jets. We get um, text messages and emails saying scramble the jets now. So it's kind of bad if it happens like Christmas a.m. or something, but you had a question for yourself. Oh, yeah, it was the building. Um, so these units were installed when the building was deployed. So that was in the second half of 2011. And we moved in at the beginning of 2012. So it wasn't really being run Six until years. 2012. Right. Um, they normally say that these things have an expected life of about 10 years, but you can probably squeeze a few more years than that out of them. Um, as long as you're not running them at capacity. Right, and we're nowhere near moment. capacity on this, so, so we're okay. Good. Yeah. Um, so that's the cooling system. Now up there, and it's not doing its thing right now, but you know like you go to a restaurant and it's a hot day and they have the outside area, everything that shoots mist around. Why does it shoot mist around at the restaurant? To keep you cool. Why does it shoot mist around in the data center? Because the data center is already chilled, right? So why would we need humidity. humidity? Humidity control, exactly correct. What happens when humidity is too low? You get static buildup, and when you touch the metal components, what sounds do you make? First, you make that sound. Then you make the second sound is, and then the third sound is, oh, 
<laughs> right? So that's not a good idea. You don't want the humidity to be too low. What about if the humidity is too high? What happens? You get condensation. What happens when you touch condensation on a metal component? The exact same sequence of noises. Yes? So both of those are undesirable. So we try and stay in that middle range that's the safe range where you'll build up static and you'll build up condensation. And so if it does, if it's not humid enough, that unit will pump out mist to raise the humidity level. Good. We're going to walk down there and I'm going to show you one more thing in here. Follow me. Touch nothing. No leaning. Oh, uh, this is Don't trip over stuff. How many units do you have of these? Well, a lot of this is for the enterprise side. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, that's the idea. We haven't had to do that. But yes, we want to know if that happens. All right. Um, so, this over here, this is the fire suppression system. Okay. So, um, these tanks are filled with a chemical called FM200. FM200 is a modern technology that replaces the previous technology, halon. Um, halon gas is a very good fire suppressant, but it has the unfortunate side effect of being incredibly toxic. So if you're in there when it triggers, you will die of poison, and that's not a win. Um, so FM200 does not poison the gas. So um, it's replaced halon in, in many data centers around the world. Um, and in the event of a fire, this will trigger, and it will shoot the halon gas out. That will essentially um, consume the oxygen in the room, and that will put the fire out. If that doesn't put the fire out, the secondary line of defense is there's the standard sprinkler system in the room. The problem with the sprinkler system is it's not so good for the hardware, so we like to not have to do that. And that's why the F200 is so important to do that for fire. For the record, we have not had a fire, but if we did, this stuff would work. So it's okay for O2 to suffocate, but it's not okay for O2 to suffocate. See, I wasn't going to say that on camera. But, <laughs> okay, let's walk this away. LSU has the same system. Has the same reason. Yes. So how long way. do you have to evacuate the room with the gas? I think it's well under a minute. Yeah, because we have our standards say like you have to leave within 60 seconds or you pass out. Something like that. Yeah. They would prefer that no one be in here when the when the F when the F two goes. Okay, out the door. Um, yes, yeah, um, it wasn't identical, but pretty similar. What I can't show you, because um, A, I don't have the key for these rooms, and B, even if I did, you can't go in, um, but these rooms are full of batteries. This is our uninterruptible power supply. How many of you own an uninterruptible power supply? Let me ask that question differently. How many of you own a laptop that has a battery? Okay, now let me ask the previous question again. How many of you own an uninterruptible power supply? How do you know? Come on out, come on out, don't be shy. Push people out of the way if you have to. Make room, we should all be here in the corridor. How do you know that you have an uninterruptible power supply? Because if you pull out the power cable, how many of you have tripped over a power cable at home? Okay. Did the laptop go down or just get dimmer in the screen? It got dimmer in the screen because the battery immediately kicks in in a fraction of a second, and so it doesn't crash. Right? So your laptop battery is itself an uninterruptible power supply. This, behind these two, I think three doors, is the uninterruptible power supply um, for the supercomputer. So it's room after room of 600, of shelf after shelf of 600 pound batteries. Each one is about that tall, that wide, that deep. Um, yes? How long is it going to display on? So you have to think about it as the data center as a whole because it's for everything in the data center. If the data center were running at maximum power capacity, it would be about 10 minutes. But the data center is currently at less than one third of power capacity, so it would be probably in excess of half an hour. Okay, um, half an hour is not very long. So what right? do you keep running in case of? So I can't show you because it's dark, and so you won't be able to see it. But just across the parking lot there is a little squat one-story brick building. And that's our generator. And oh. the generator kicks in within less than a minute. So the fact that we have 
something like 30 minutes of battery power is almost entirely irrelevant. What matters is that the generator comes on very quickly. And when the generator comes on, there's a 2,500 gallon diesel tank under the parking lot, it's buried beneath the parking lot. And that is enough to power, if the data center were running at full power capacity, which again, it's not, but if it were, that would be enough to power the data center for 24 hours, roughly. Um, but on top of that, we have a contract with a third party company who in the event of a power outage has to bring in their tanker truck and continuously refill that tank yes. until we get central power restored into the building. Um, the only time that doesn't work out so well, um, and by the way, it's not an upcharge per gallon, it's a flat rate per unit. It's essentially an insurance policy. But um, there's only one circumstance where that won't do the trick. Anybody know what it is? Uh, no, because they'll, they'll hire another company. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, that would be a problem. I wasn't thinking of that one, but that's definitely <laughs> true. Yes, yeah, if you would destroy the generator, then yeah, we're out of business. But I'm thinking of a circumstance where the generator is fine, but we're still going to crash. No, because we got the diesel truck coming in. The mine was one of the few to not be severed. And, uh, well, so not so much that, although that's true too, but I think it's underground, so it's hard to make that happen. Um, I think it's buried oh, deep enough they, that a backhoe wouldn't take it out. Say. Yeah, the backhoe Back problems usually affect more the uh, network than the power, but yes. Anybody know? What's a circumstance under which you cannot bring in a tanker truck? Be specific. Tornadoes? So tornadoes Earthquakes. are brief. So if a tornado happened, that's not a big deal. It won't prevent the tanker truck. Earthquake? Yeah. Ice storm. <laughs> Ice. So we actually had the worst ice storm in state history in November of 2011, sorry, 2007. And here's how I know, because my wife was extremely pregnant with our first child on that, at that time. Um, and we ended up in a hotel room. And during the night was when the power outage occurred. And we were lucky because we had the inward room instead of the outward facing room. So in the morning when there was no power at all, we were at least facing the swimming pool and we were not facing the freezing outdoors, and so we didn't die in our sleep. I don't think anyone died in their sleep, but you know what I mean, right? Um, and, um, but the ice storm, it was the worst ice storm in state history, and they couldn't bring the diesel tanker truck in as a result of that. And we were actually in, our, in a previous, a different building on the other side of town at the time, but the principle was the same. Um, and we were within a few hours of having to shut down the supercomputer when the tanker finally made it. So it's a big, big deal when these kinds of disasters happen. Now, the wonderful thing about this data center is that it is resilient to the worst sort of natural disaster that commonly happens in this part of the country. What is the worst, most extreme natural disaster that commonly happens in this part of the United States? Tornadoes. Tornadoes, exactly correct, good. So the data center is resilient to an EF5, the worst sort of tornado. EF5, EF5, the EF scale is not measured by wind speed, although they can approximate the rough wind speed range associated with it. It's measured by damage on the ground. EF5 means it completely wipes out everything on the ground. It destroys all buildings, um, except the data center. The data center will still be here. The rest of the building fine, but the data center will be here after an EF5 tornado. Um, and, and by the way, we haven't technically tested that <laughs> you don't want to test in the sense that actually um, most of the ODU Mormon campus almost never gets hit by tornadoes. Once in a great while, but, but quite rarely. Um, the next suburb over regularly gets hit by tornadoes. Um, okay, yes, question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, why is it so bad? Oh, if the supercomputer oh, shuts down? Um, the data center was designed not just for the supercomputer, but for all the enterprise stuff. So why would it be bad if the payroll system shut down? Because then we wouldn't get paid, right? So um, it's it's mission critical systems are in the data center alongside the supercomputer. Now the supercomputer is also mission critical, but it's not mission critical hour by hour or day by day. It's mission critical mission critical month by month and semester by semester and year by year. Faculty are not judged on research productivity per day. They're judged on research productivity per year. As a faculty member, I'm evaluated once per year on whether I'm doing good enough teaching.
So this is where you run the forecasts for the national Among other things, thing? yes. Yeah. Um, in so fact, our, our number one consumer of supercomputing resources is weather forecasting, both real-time, uh, let's call it pseudo-operational runs. We're not emission runs, but pseudo-operational runs and runs for publications that are not accurate. Mm -hmm. And that constitutes typically a hair over 50% of what it used to be. Good. Yes, you, Israel. Oh, um, you mentioned that these weather forecasts are temporary. Roughly, yeah. Why? Um, so there was actually a study done by, I think it was Lawrence Berkeley Lab several years ago, an informal study, where they created a spreadsheet that will calculate when does it become cheaper to buy a new supercomputer that will keep operations old. Because as the components get better and better, um, the cost of the data center space, the cost of the power and cooling, the cost of the labor per unit of computing capacity goes up and up, right? So at some point, it's better to replace it. For this part of the country, given our power costs, that some point is between 42 and 49. Where are you? Uh, we are roughly month. Uh, I think we're two, we're two years in. Right. So two and a half. Two are you doing something with the cloud for um, So cloud for tightly coupled HPC costs between five and a half and ten and a half times as much as four hour and that's a, that's the on premise. That's all in. That's not just the hardware and software, but space, power, cooling, labor, um, the whole deal. Even the administrative cost of figuring out how much it costs. So, do you rent or like lease or buy it? Um, we typically do it on a lease cycle, yes. Um, and the reason for that is the incremental cost of leasing in a sort of apples to apples comparison, in a very pure and in some sense naive comparison, is a teeny tiny bit higher than purchasing outright. Mm -hmm but we can spread out the cost over multiple years. And more than that, because we then sell it back to the lease company or they reclaim it, yeah. um, then we actually can buy a bigger thing because we're going to give it back and not repeat it. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes time to get the next one, we're ready to get the next one um, on essentially the same price usage. Okay. Good, now it's time for everybody to ask me the why did you question. These are the meta questions about how I gave the speech. We all were carefully doing it, right? Okay. Why did you dance? Why did I dance on a little thing? So did you remember it? No, no, no. Did you notice me doing it and did it stick in your head? That's why I did it. Because whenever you do something goofy, it sticks <laughs> in people's heads. So when I teach the difference between sequential versus random access memory, I literally jump around to demonstrate random access. And it's silly, it's goofy, but it sticks in your head. And I don't, I, right, I, I long since have abandoned my dignity in exchange <laughs> for being more effective. I'd rather you remember. Yes? Why did you have open pool bottles and open hot bottles instead of in closing it? Instead of closing the cold out and closing the we did enclose in our previous data center. In this data center, we have so much cooling capacity. We have more cooling capacity than power capacity, the way that we're currently set up, and that's a rather complicated issue. But I'm happy to discuss offline, but it's probably beyond what we can do here. Um, and so um, the cost of the materials we need to enclose it exceeds the value we get. So if we got to the point where that was no longer true, then we might do an enclosure. But the problem with enclosing it more than the simplest minimal version. So in the old data center, we just put doors on each end and that was it. And that traps or, or sort of influences some of the cold air, but a lot of it is escaping up top. Do you, uh, so you, do you enclose the cold aisle or the hot aisle? The cold. Okay. So yeah. we can find the floor then? Uh, in so that one, it was purely, no, in that so one, it was purely down. overhang pool. It was actually sit on top pools because we could, in that data center on the other side of town, we couldn't do overhang because there was a canopy just above the racks, the canopy was full of asbestos. And that's six figures and six months, if you want to get rid of it. And 
we had neither of those. <laughs> Good, yes. Sure. Oh, I just didn't have time for it. Um, it is kind of fun to do. I've kind of gotten out of the habit because then I have to go looking for that suction cuppy yeah. thing. Um, but yes, sometimes I have done that. One of the things that turned me off of it a little bit, I was doing a data center tour, this was probably 10 years ago, uh, during our annual Oklahoma Supercomputing Symposium. I do a tour the first night as part of that. Um, and I popped up the tile to show people, and I said, whatever you do, don't fall in the hole. And I was joking, and I turned my back, and bang, somebody fell in the hole. So rather than risk the insurance thing, that kind of reduced my interest. It, that wasn't a deciding factor, but all of these things together. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting to see, but it, I'm sorry. Did I have oh, well, happily, they didn't break their leg, but I would say they were probably a few inches from breaking because it's a two foot underfloor. You stick your foot in a two foot deep hole that has hard edges, chances are you're gonna snap your feet. Yeah. I once, in somebody's front yard, I tripped over the bricking they had around the garden area because it was dark and they had bricking, and I tripped over it, and I landed with my fin on the bricking, and I had edema in that leg for over a year. Basically, fluid leaked out of my foot for a year. Oh, yeah, it was bad. So, it's not really recommended. Good question. So, why did you introduce the supercomputer to speed over the Oh. Um, the cabinets that are labeled the Boomer are condominium cabinets from the previous supercomputer. And our policy is you get to keep the condominium components for the one you bought it for and the next one you got for it. Mm -hmm. So those were the Boomer racks of Schooner. And in fact, because of the choices we made, you can um, visually tell with the switch, the tall racks are Schooner, the short racks are Boomer. We went from 43 to 44. You know what I mean. <laughs> Good, yes. Uh, why did you explain things in the CPU computer? Why not start with computing the CPU story? Oh, because at that point, nobody cares. Um, so what I want to do is, bearing in mind that almost everybody who takes a tour knows how to call, um, I want to draw them in emotionally. And they are drawn in emotionally. OK, so first of all, the overwhelming majority of people who show up to the computer don't know what the computer so I need to get that covered immediately. Then I need to get to what's the supercomputer made of because I want it to resonate with something they're already familiar with. And so this is why I kept comparing it to a PC because they know what a PC is. Now they get the idea a supercomputer is a stack of things, right? So we weren't ready to talk about power and cooling until much later because they wouldn't be interested in it until they understood what the heck a supercomputer is. Now, of course, that's all theory. I can't prove any of that. But my experience to date, based on the way people react to all of that when doing the roughly the same. Yeah, I think we talk about the mechanicals after they get fascinated by the thing. They, because the mechanicals otherwise are just window dressing. They, they, they don't resonate with people. And I, I think when I talked to you recently, that someone was telling me they sent some of their people on a tour at another institution and the tour was run by the data center person. All they talked about were the mechanicals. And the problem with that approach is if you're not into mechanicals, and that would be well under 1% of the world's population, in fact, well under 1% of the people who show up for the tour, the mechanicals are only interesting in the context of the thing that the people are doing. Mm -hmm. Good. More. These are great questions. I love these. Why do you keep moving people around? Why do I keep moving people around? Because as soon as you stop, you get bored. So mm -hmm. my experience, so I started teaching by teaching ballroom dancing. And my experience was that learning to teach by teaching a physical activity is the best way to learn to teach. Number one, you get immediate feedback about whether your way of teaching, whether your pedagogy is effective. You can tell, oh, this worked and this didn't. 
see it within moments. Um, but the second thing that came out of that was I learned very quickly that activity is a perfect substitute for learning. So if, I, if they're not learning something, at least they're moving around. As soon as I let them stop, they're gone. So this, by the way, the same principle, why did I make you keep raising your hand, right? I do this in my own class when I teach programming for not making. I'm constantly asking them yes, no questions, or pick between these two things or whatever. Constantly doing that. Because if they're raising their hand, they're probably listening. It also answers the question, why am I so bad? Part of it is, of course, <laughs> recreation. I'm just laughing. But part of it is, if I'm loud, you can't tune out. You can't go to sleep while I'm talking. And almost nobody ever sleeps in my class. Almost. It does happen occasionally. <laughs> I have that strategy of I can drop a heavy book on the floor and I'll wake up. Um, but it's very, very rare that it's so loud. Good. What else? These are really great questions. Yes. And then I'll go there. Yes, the chair. Ooh, why do I look so happy? There are two reasons. One of them is I actually am genuinely happy. I love giving tours. It's so much fun. But the other reason is if I'm not enthusiastic about it, why on earth would you be? So I'm modeling not just the behavior I want from the people on the tour. I'm modeling the mood I want from the people on the tour. And again, the feedback is they love the tour. And I think, it, again, I can't prove it. But I'm willing to bet, I would bet good money that a big part of the reason that the tours are successful is because they have a wonderful time because I fool them into having a wonderful time by having a wonderful time myself. And there's no better way to convince somebody that something is fun than to have fun doing it in front of them. <laughs> oh, no, I'm totally happy. Like I said, I love giving tours. It's awesome. It's one of the best parts of the job. But even if I hated it, I would still behave the same way because it's effective. I want you to have fun because then you'll feel good. Good. And then you had a question. Oh, because in aisles 5 through 12, that's the enterprise stuff. Um, so it's got things like credit card data, it's got social security numbers, all that other stuff. And there are very strict rules about who's allowed to be there. And if you are there and you're not allowed to be there, all kinds of bad things happen, starting with moving the money. So no, there's not a chance in hell I'm going to let you go down to level five. No way. Yes? Can you tell us a little bit about the monitoring of the application? I can, although we're, that's taking us out of the why did you, but let's go ahead and do that for a second. Um, so there are cameras, there are temperature and humidity sensors, all over the data center, and, and there are some that are sort of concentrated in the first few rows where the research stuff is, and they are constantly monitoring, and there are thresholds associated with them that will trigger them to send messages and even shut stuff down if we exceed certain thresholds. How far is the What do you mean? Like physically, where are they located? Yeah. Um, so some of them are in Norman, some of them are in other surrounding towns. I think the farthest drive anybody has among the Oscar operations team is maybe 30 minutes, but there are people, I, okay, my, my house is sort of around the corner from the hotel. You're five minutes away. You're 45 minutes away. Okay. Okay. So, so you are the farthest away then. Because Dave is in uh, six drive. I'm sorry, go ahead. We calculated the upcharge associated with that, and there's no way to justify the cost. It would increase our labor cost by about 40%. And the problem is it wouldn't add value in a meaningful way. This goes back to the um, researchers are, judged, are evaluated on productivity per year. So if we go down for a day, that's not the end of the world. Um, on the other hand, if we have to cut our hardware budget by 40%, our labor budget by 40%, that's a huge crisis. And, and that's basically the trade-off we have to make. They're not going to magically give us more budget. And also, like, everything is automated, so everything is scripted and sensors. It is, but there, yeah. are still, there are things that could go wrong during Christmas mm -hmm. break, which is really the, the most vulnerable time. So Christmas yeah. break in practice takes into account that, like, if New Year's Day is Thursday, nobody's coming in on Friday, right? Um, 
So taking all of that into account, the longest I could come up with was about 12 and a half calendar days. They call it 13, right? So if something goes wrong during those 13 days, almost everything we have in, and, and let's say it's an ice storm over Christmas break on top of that. I, I grew up in Buffalo, so I can drive on bad roads. Um, so, and I live seven minutes from the data center. So if there were a problem, I could get on the phone with the team and have them talk me through the physical thing that they could not come the 45 minutes and give me 10 hours of traffic on the mm -hmm. ice storm. <laughs> Um, they could talk me through whatever they want. I, I'm completely incompetent in anything system related, but they could talk me step by step through what needs to be done. And most of the stuff actually doesn't require physical intervention, yeah. it requires log in. Just to make up. Right. And log in intervention, even during high school. Good. That's a great question. More, more. These are so good. Yes. Why don't you have traffic or IT logos or anything like that? Up to this point, we haven't been able to justify prioritizing the labor associated with it. At one point, we thought that, so we were in this building um, right by the front entrance. Those of you who got trapped between the outer door and the inner door, the stuff on your immediate left, just as you got through the inner door, used to be where our office was. We, we change offices on average about every 10 years, um, like change buildings. Um, because we're a non-academic unit, so we're like the lowest priority. Um, but um, that space, there's a big glass wall there, and you can't see it, but there's actually a film on the inside of one of the big glass walls that you can project in 3D on it. Um, but, and we bought a projector that was appropriate for that, and then um, I think six months after we bought the projector, they moved us to the new office. So that's where we gave up on doing that sort of display for the office, Again, we could, in theory, do it for the data center. It would only be eye candy during a tour because, of course, the, the um, systems folks don't give a crap. It, it's only going to be interesting to the tourists, and they're only going to see it for 10 minutes. It's very, very hard to justify the labor cost of that and make it a priority. So we have to. Yes, Ken. Anybody who wants one under any circumstances. I think you're asking a somewhat different question. Do we go chase people down to offer no, tours no, to them? Not that not. much. And there's actually been a study. Right. So we would be happy to do that if they came to us. Um, we're more likely to do it for faculty that are being recruited than students, but only in the sense that we get more requests for that. Yeah. Right and 10% of the graduate students is a pretty significant number and they are working for the faculty who have the largest amount of interested funding that's not 100% but that's substantially true so we uh, facilitate somewhere in excess of 20% of OU's external research Sorry. Ever use another right and Oh, yeah, yeah. No, there's no question that that would be valuable. We just haven't pursued it because they haven't pursued that. Yeah. Good. Who else owes me a wide jet? I'd like to build a data center with a gas fire suppressor and water. Oh, um, the water is a fail safe in case the gas doesn't work. Like the fire is too big and the gas is going to have to come out. I stayed off. No pressure loss. I'll just probably stay off. Stay. The goal is to not burn the building. When you get to that point, you want to save the building you can keep. But the first goal is not to keep the building. Yes, but um, <laughs> usually they scrambled out of the data center and the environment is. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, right, I'm not. <laughs> Wasn't born yesterday. Who owes a lie to you? Yes. And I'll go there. You go first. So we have some of both, but the demand for shared memory is quite low compared to. Uh, so we get not very much open MP, but lots of MPI. Um, particularly the weather folks, um, if they tried to do it in shared memory, they would fail miserably because they're often running on multiple terabytes. Um, we could do that, but then nothing else would get done because shared memory compared to distributed is quite expensive per terabyte. Um, one of the, so we do have one public server that anybody can use that's a full terabyte of RAM. It is almost never full. We have to fight about that. Almost all of the runs we see either fit in 32 or 64 gig of RAM or use multiple servers operating together. So either way, they don't need to open the server. There's a little bit, there's enough to justify doing one, but there wasn't enough to justify doing two. And any money we spend on one thing, we can't spend on another. And what we found historically is the only thing our users complain about is how long they wait in queue because they've got to start running. And so our goal is to maximize the number of cores we have available so that we can maximize the throughput of the job as a whole. Do you allocate full nodes? Someone's got 32 so, or 32 I, so we're at the point job. now where we are starting to not do that exclusively. So if it's like an MPI job, then typically if it's each multiple nodes, you lose all of each multiple node. Typically mm -hmm. the cores, not the RAM. We very rarely see someone max out the RAM on an MPI. Um, when we see single node or single core jobs, we like to pack those onto um, a server with many jobs on it and get as close to full as we possibly can. Where full is defined as either full on the RAM or full on the RAM. Um, and that's basi basically a change from the last one. So the last one, we had 16 cores per server. And now we have 20 or 24 for most of the servers. The next generation, we got to figure we'll be 32 to 48 cores per server. So the idea that we can continue to say any job that's on node might as well have the whole node goes away from there. Mm -hmm. Good, more. Yes? Uh, oh, um, typically we'll let people ask that question. They don't usually ask what software we're running. We will ask what applications we run. And I have a stock answer for that. Literally everything from aerospace to philology. And then I start breaking down what our top three are. So number one, meteorology, number two, molecular dynamics, and I explain what that is. Number three, high energy physics, and I explain what that is. Number four, everything else in that. Yes. Oh yeah, we're we're running uh, CentOS 7. I'm sorry. No, we don't use any of those. Um, it, it's all hand deployed, so to speak. I, I don't know exactly how you would characterize it, but we're not using um, any of the things like rocks that sort of, um, or bright uh, manager, any of those things. We're, we're using salt and uh, a couple other software components to actually do the physical deployment, but the design of it is sort of done by hand. Somebody owe me a why did you? Do we use private cloud? Yes, we have a small internal research cloud that we use. Um, and in fact, um, we're in a design phase now for our next supercomputer, which is about three years from now. And part of that is we're designing the internal research cloud to be completely rebuilt from the ground up. Jason is the result of that design work. He made a lot of design those of you who are uh, geeky enough to know what OpenStack is. I have to confess I know the name, but not really much about what it is. I know it only in the vaguest possible terms. For the record, I'm entirely 